Hello, and uh, welcome to everyone who joined us today for this installment of Caterpillar Webcast focused on the energy business uh, entitled Powering Data Centers, Emerging Options for Quality Energy. Uh, my name is Nick Kelch with Caterpillar Electric Power. I'll be your moderator today. Uh, we have a full hour session planned, so we'll get to it shortly. Uh, we'll be doing 15 minutes of actually presenting today. We're holding 10 minutes for live over audio Q&A at the end of the session. Uh, we'll be selecting some, some of your questions to read aloud and pose to our, our speakers today. So um, without further ado, what I'd like to do is again present uh, Brian Jabeck. He'll kick us off. Uh, Brian again has mission critical and engineering consultancy responsibilities for Caterpillar. Brian. Thanks, Nick. Uh, first off, I wanted to thank everybody for taking the time today to call on this afternoon. So what do you need out of your emergency power system? Uh, the type of product that you use for your emergency power system uh, is heavily impacted by, by your system design, your facility requirements, uh, your business model, along with many other factors, uh, some named here. You know, Every design, every facility is focused on driving reliability and uptime while utilizing an economic solution uh, for your facility and for your customers. Does your site have specific missions requirements? Uh, is there an opportunity uh, to work with your local utility on a peaking contract? Or are you in a, a location or, or somewhere in the globe that uh, has a, a less reliable utility source? Uh, what are your facility, your facility loads, expansion plans, uh, and, and, and how do you, man, you plan to manage those loads for your facility? So as you think about I guess, some of your key needs, whether it's a, a design or a facility that you have, uh, we're going to discuss different power generation solutions today. Um, we're going to review at a high level some traditional basic data center designs, how that's going to impact your power system. Uh, and then we'll talk about how natural gas generator sets and diesel generator sets uh, fit into that design. And we'll have a discussion on if those solutions will make sense for your facility. I wanted to open up with high-level technology differences between diesel engines and, and natural gas engines uh, as a level set with everybody on the phone. Diesel engines, uh, typically low-hour solutions, um, lowest initial installed cost, uh, tend to have lower, uh, lower efficiency than natural gas engines. Uh, they do have best starting uh, and load acceptance characteristics. Uh, and with diesel engines uh, in North America and in many other countries, you have uh, significant emissions considerations and permitting requirements for your facilities. Natural gas engines, uh, traditionally medium to high hour, have a, a higher initial installed cost than diesel, um, but a similar installed cost to uh, US EPA Tier 4 certified product. Uh, and if you have a, an application uh, that requires additional after treatment, uh, it, it will narrow the, the installed cost gap between diesel and natural gas engines. Uh, Natural gas product is well suited for CHP applications, good transient performance, and can be found in, in low hour applications with emissions uh, or fuel considerations. Diesel generator sets have been the technology of choice uh, for the data center and mission critical market uh, for years and will continue to be, to be the stable uh, offering of your emergency power system moving forward. And even though we continue, uh, and diesel remains to be the preferred solution, you know, we continue to be asked uh, by customers, by engineers, about the natural gas product, about how to properly apply it, about if it will work for their mission-critical application. And that was really the driver for uh, the conversation today, is to start the conversation to, to see how natural gas uh, and diesel both fit into your application and to, to see if there is, um, if your facility will work for some alternative solutions. So as we discuss and, and to go a little bit more uh, into the diesel power generation, uh, you have a diesel generator sets uh, are a, a robust proven product uh, for your emergency power and facility backup. Uh, they're power dense and typically have, as I noted before, the, the lower initial installed cost versus natural gas generator sets. Uh, product is capable of being online, ready to accept low within 10 seconds. Uh, the ability to comply with, with, with NFPA 110, which differentiates it uh, from some of the larger natural gas generator sets uh, that will struggle to be online and accept full load within 10 seconds. Um, diesel units also have very strong uh, cap transient capability, the ability to recover, uh, accept and recover from a full block load if your facility needs 
uh, needs that capability. One of the challenges, as we highlighted before, for diesel product, uh, especially in uh, North America and the United States, but many other countries as well, uh, is related to the, the emissions requirements for uh, diesel engines and diesel generator sets. Um, starting at a high level, um, in North America speaking, we have two different classes of, of diesel generator sets being sold today, stationary emergency for standby applications, or your, your Tier 4 interim or Tier 4 final certified product moving forward. So I wanted to review this at a high level here. Um, stationary emergency gen sets approved only for emergency, emergency standby application. I did want to note that that is independent of engine manufacturer rating. So you can buy a product from an engine manufacturer that is prime or continuous rated diesel generator set that is only rated for stationary emergency use. Suitable use for that product, uh, emergency only applications. You have 100 hours of maintenance and testing uh, for operation of that unit. You get up to 50 hours of general use out of that 100 hours of maintenance and testing for things such as storm avoidance, uh, and up to 100 hours demand response, again, out of that 100 hours of maintenance and testing. I do want to note that in the event of an outage, um, your stationary emergency product is able to run for uh, the duration of that outage and is not limited to, to any, uh, any hour limitation during that event. Uh, in applications where your local emissions code may require um, low emissions targets, we see a lot of stationary emergency generator sets installed uh, with SCRs or other third-party after treatment. It gives you the ability to meet your local code while complying with, with federal um, or state code. Again, legal only for emergency applications and will have uh, much of the same suitable, le suitable use uh, as the, the standard stationary emergency product. The other emissions uh, consideration and level that we talked about was the US EPA Tier 4 certification. Again, across the globe, you, you might see uh, similar. I don't think anything goes uh, quite as stringent as Tier 4 and Tier 4 final, but, but you're gonna, you, you may see uh, more strict uh, emission certifications for the diesel product. For US EPA Tier 4 certification, it is a manufactured, designed, and supplied generator set along with selective catalytic reduction, diesel oxidation catalyst, uh, and or diesel particulate filter. Um, for the federal regulation, there is no runtime limitation. Obviously, local codes um, may be different than that. Uh, as we get ready here to move into 2015 and talk about Tier 4 final, um, generally speaking, you're looking at products for the diesel gen sets 200 kW and larger that will require after treatment to comply with, with the Tier 4 certification. A suitable use in those applications of prime continuous operations, uh, any, any low emissions that are required uh, for site permits, or if you're just looking to have a, a green footprint and, and a green facility. Um, one of the challenges that comes with the Tier 4 certification is uh, the, the inducement policy, which limits product availability in the event of a fault in, in your after-treatment uh, system and could um, cause you to not be able to, to provide uh, as reliable uh, standby power for your facility, depending on what that fault may be. Wanted to change directions here uh, a little bit, and we'll talk about um, two different types of a very high level, a very basic data center designs, uh, parallel systems, and, and distributed or, or pod type designs. Um, talk about how they apply to both diesel and natural gas products and, and how each fit into each design. Again, very high level, very basic. I did want to review the one line on the right side of your screen uh, since we used it a few different times through the presentation. Uh, here, we've got a it's, it's a basic parallel system, three 2,000 kW diesel generator sets parallel to a common bus with a single utility feed, critical load supported by four 750 kBA UPSs, uh, and then that, that entire facility, critical and non-critical load supported uh, by the six megawatt emergency power system. Parallel system is, is, is a more complex design, uh, but does provide additional ability and capability for uh, for your power system and give you flexibility in how you're able to operate. Um, those paralleling options can be can be very basic to to package or to unpackage and or controls only type solutions, and can be very complex uh, with a full lineup of custom, custom paralleling switch gear for your facility. Having the ability to parallel uh, and, and that added system control allows for system redundancy, 
um, and can provide the ability to load shed, load add, to avoid any, any low load scenarios in the event that full capacity of your power generation system is not needed uh, to carry the facility load during a specific event. One of the um, things to note with, with uh, the parallel system is the time to parallel. Traditionally takes um, generators that's are right, the diesel generators that are able to start very quickly and can be ready to accept load within within 10 seconds. But there are times where paralleling those units together will take uh, a little bit more time, and so that often drives a longer ride through UPSs as part of the parallel system designs. Uh, I think the um, looking at five to 15 minutes of, of UPS ride through. Uh, for many of these parallel systems, it uh, doesn't, doesn't need to be that way, but for many of them uh, supplied through North America and throughout the globe, look, look at uh, and use the, the 5 to 15 minute UPS ride through. So how does this tie into the diesel product? And, and we'll talk a little bit here and then a little bit more when Mike gets on about how, how that can, um, the natural gas product could fit into the space. So using the same, the same one line, you know, diesel generator sets are capable of very fast start time and we'll be able to quickly start quickly parallel to be able to transition that load from battery discharge onto your backup power system and onto those generators quickly. Diesel product has very strong transient capability, and in the event that it's needed in this scenario, you could pick up and recover again from that full block load. And generally speaking, uh, it's the lowest initial installed cost, and the diesel product, as we talked before, it's the robust, reliable solution that has been proven in the market for your facility needs. Uh, one of the things that I, I wanted to to discuss and just ask a question is as you know as we just talked about on the last slide that traditionally you're looking at five to fifteen minutes of battery ride through um, with this design from your UPS system would it be possible to use a two megawatt natural gas generator set in this design and that would take around twenty to thirty seconds to start and anywhere from one to two minutes to be hundred percent loaded is is it possible for that to work for your facility and for your application more to discuss on that when, when Mike gets on here in a few minutes. The other design I wanted to run through, uh, the distributed system design that we see uh, in traditional data center market today. It's a simplified design, generally speaking, uh, has a single generator set to a single set of critical or non-critical loans. In this one line, uh, we see we, uh, we have a 2N design, two 2000 kW diesel gen sets, two 750 kVA UPSs, and, and two static transfer switches all supporting the same critical, non-critical load. Each 2 megawatt gen set has the ability to support full load on its own, and a single 750 kVA UPS will ensure that the critical load is powered long enough uh, for one of the gen sets to get online to be able to accept all of that load. Design offers great flexibility and is very scalable to grow as your facility grows and to allow for easy facility expansion. It's a very cost-effective option. Um, things that are you know, worth noting is Limited control between generator sets um, will will have to be planned for and designed for, and we'll talk on the next slide about what some of those challenges could arise um, with some of the limited control in a distributed type system. Um, wanted to start by saying in this in this example, we're talking natural gas and diesel generator sets. That diesel generator sets are the clear choice for use in, in distributed systems. If the UPS system uh, is a seconds of ride through instead of minutes, um, which is um, can be typical for this design since you do not have to have time to parallel. You can have 10 to 25 seconds of ride through to get onto your generator set. And in that event, you require um, the diesel generator set with the fast starting and the ability to pick up um, larger amounts of load um, in, in that short, of, short amount of time. As I highlighted before, one of the challenges with the system is the need to be, uh, that needs to be accounted for is the possibility of low load scenarios. Without the ability to parallel units, to perform load shed, load add. Um, we always recommend each generator set loaded to 30%. Uh, so for an example, if a single generator set here, if there's an event that happens at a facility that is not fully built out, and you could, you could be running at 5% load on a single generator set without the ability to, uh, to add load, that can cause uh, accelerated generator wear. Um, in addition to if you have any after treatment equipment on your system, um, not meeting minimum exhaust temperatures can cause your after treatment system not to not to start to function, uh, and or could cause problems with clogging of filters, uh, et cetera, downstream that can cause uh, back pressure alarms and even lead to shutdown during extended outages. Uh, something to to be uh, to take note of and to plan for in, in the design and system load banks uh, is is always a, a good option 
if there is the, the opportunity for a low load scenario for your facility. So as we get ready to, to hand this over uh, and to transition to the next part of the presentation, I wanted to share a, a scenario to consider. If you were looking at a, a parallel system being installed in a location where Tier 4 certified product is required or where after treatment is needed to meet local emissions regulations, does the natural gas product become a viable option or an alternative? Needing the Tier 4 certified product or needing SCRs and diesel oxidation catalysts for the diesel product eliminates the initial installed cost advantages versus the natural gas gensets. As we discussed, you have 5 to 15 minutes of UPS ride-through. Can you handle a system that will take 60 to 120 seconds to accept the full load? Transient capability, also a concern, but you can manage a, a soft trans transition from UPS discharge onto your natural gas system and ensure the steps are small enough uh, and that there's minimal transient impact so your system and facility will remain online and will transition load. Uh, is managing this starting and, and load transfer a good alternative to needing to manage urea systems, urea injection, urea storage, you know, and other performance uh, and, and performing additional maintenance on all of the after treatment components for your system. This added complexity to the diesel product drives up cost and the natural gas solution could be a less costly system to own and operate. And finally, is there potential at your location to support or reinforce your local utility and use your standby power system to also generate additional revenue? With that, I will pass it over to Mike. Thanks, Brian. Appreciate that. Uh, when we look at data centers and you start thinking about how they use energy, they're typically a very large user of energy and cost is very important and trying to usually locate a facility at a place where you're going to get good cost of energy. In addition, reliability is also a very key element. And what we are looking at now on a national basis here in the states in particular is the coal retirements that are driving uh, a lot of issues within the grid or could be. And the question now becomes, what will happen to the electric energy costs? As we take the 60 gigawatts of power between now and 2020 and take those offline, what effect is that going to have on the cost of energy? Coal being one of the lowest cost energies that we have, how are we going to replace that? And that's a potential challenge for a lot of areas. In addition, what kind of reliability is that going to drive to these systems? Putting an extra 60 gigawatts of power online and trying to make sure that they're doing, particularly if they come in renewable sources, can be a real challenge to the grid. Something that a data center has to take into consideration and, and be prepared to deal with. Well, one of the things that utilities deal with is uh, working with um, their peaks and supplying energy at the cost to data centers. And their issue is uh, one of these situations where we've got a, a community here that has a summer and a winter peak. And if we look at a chart like the utilities would look at, they're looking at a day of the year, so 365 days a year on the x-axis. They're looking at the hour of the day on the uh, y-axis. And the, so 24 hours a day, and the amount of kilowatts that are being used. And so here you can see that the wider the peaks, the higher those loads are, and the more costly that energy is to a utility to provide. Many of these utilities are going to be looking for help as they lose some of their traditional sources of power, and they're going to be looking for assistance to be able to pick up these peaks. And data centers being a very large load, the utilities really like having them online, but they also could use some help from some of these in many locations around the country. Again, we notice that the, uh, the summer and the winter peaks are showing here, and then the blue-colored uh, areas are in the summer and the spring and the fall, uh, where the energy is not quite as, as much needed. Here you have an application where it's another community, not more than two or 300 miles away from the first one, where all we have is a summer peak, the mountain during the summer months. And so load profiles change on a regular basis, and every community has one of these load profiles. And the utilities that are serving these folks are caring about this, and they're wanting to buy, buy you with high-quality power. They're also looking for assistance in many cases to be able to help, help you out with your quality needs. So when you look at these situations, you're trying to understand what your use of power is as compared to what your local utility's power use is, not only by the time of day, but also from the seasonal shapes of those load profiles. 
many of the utilities that we're talking about actually use gas generator sets to help them through that peaking period. And uh, so uh, they understand that reliability is critical, critical and that they're very concerned about making sure that those kilowatts are being distributed uh, to their communities. And they're the ones who are started using gas generator sets to provide that quality power. And we see that a lot of data centers could use some of these uh, power sources as well. If we look at a traditional data center, it's not uncommon to have dual feeds, usually coming from two different substations. Uh, that's for power reliability and for quality, usually paralleled under the, the bus that we're talking about. Being able to put a um, standby generator set or a pair of peaking units out there, gas units out there as a sub-utility could be a help in making sure that you're able to power your utility and your data center. Uh, what happens under normal circumstances is that if you only have one substation or one feed available, uh, using these power generators as your second feed, in addition to providing backup power and for being able to provide uh, peaking power, can be very positive and beneficial to your, um, to your installation. Gas engines do, in fact, have uh, low emissions. Most engines, uh, gas engines today, are rated at either one gram NOx per brake horsepower hour, or uh, many of them are available, most of them are available in uh, half gram NOx uh, as well. They do have good electrical efficiency. Many of them, in between 40 and 44 percent of electrical efficiency is not uncommon in these units. Lower owning and operating costs is a hallmark to the gas engines in that over time uh, their service intervals are significantly longer than what those of uh, diesel products are and the fuel consumption is uh, is very good on these engines making them a prime objective for low owning and operating costs if you have a use for heat in your facility either for heating installations and parts of it or office space or you can be using it to actually create a cold water combined heat and power operations can be very useful and just the fact that there is no local fuel storage is, can be an important item, particularly if you're in a coastal area or a flood-prone uh, flood area, places uh, down along the coastal areas, or as we saw in New York City uh, here uh, just with uh, Hurricane Sandy, you do end up with uh, issues with the local fuel sources. And natural gas pipelines, uh, though they may be flooded and underwater, they continue to flow gas at a very positive rate. Gas engines also have capabilities of good ambient temperatures and altitude capability. So the uh, D rates or uh, challenges with altitude and temperature can be minimized by optimizing your systems to be able to handle those types of loads. And they do accept a wide range of gaseous fuels. Uh, we've also had a number of data centers that have been asking us about the ability to burn low energy fuels, fuels that were available from a landfill or from an ag biogas facility. And those engines can, in fact, burn those types of fuels. They also have good transient capabilities. And uh, people traditionally don't think of gas engines as being good with transients, but they do um, do a good job. But they are different than that of a diesel engine. And I'd like to share with you a little bit about that. The diesel engines and natural gas engines all have very good um, operating characteristics, and all of those engines have a lot of similarities. They're all four-stroke design. Air intake and exhaust systems are virtually the same. Size is a little bit different for heat rates, but the concepts of how you do that are exactly the same. Generators and electrical systems are, in fact, identical. So if I have a 1,000 kW diesel generator set, I would use the same generator in a continuous application as I would for a gas engine. And cooling systems are very similar in design and concept as well. The real differences come when you start looking at ignition systems and fuel systems. The diesel ignition system is compression ignition, while the gas engine is a spark ignited system. And the fuel system on a diesel engine is a direct injection uh, through a nozzle going into the cylinder, whereas the natural gas engines are carbureted. And the gas and diesel engines, as a result of those fuel and ignition systems, pick up loads differently. Let's take a look at that. If you look at the blue system on here, that would be the air intake system on a diesel engine. The red would be the exhaust system. When the engine starts to slow down, when a load is placed on that engine, it basically calls for more fuel, just like you would in a car with your accelerator. You need to push the accelerator to go up the hill when it calls for a greater load. The situation with the diesel engine is that it basically has a lot of excess air in the cylinder, and the unit injector on there increases the amount of fuel flow into the cylinder, atomizing additional fuel, which then uh, creates more power in the cylinder. 
the heat goes up through the turbocharger and more air is brought in through the system. So the load is picked up very quickly in that diesel engine. Gas engines do a little bit different. Instead of being able to just apply the gas straight into a cylinder with excess air, there's an air-fuel ratio that has to be um, mixed between the air and the fuel before it gets into the cylinder. And it does take more time, relatively speaking. Keep in mind that these engines are spinning at 1,800 RPM, so the times we're talking about are relative in, in nature. Uh, when the gas engine calls for more heat, it does exactly the same thing. It, it says, I need more heat, I need to speed up the engine, and at that point, the throttle will open up to allow more air and fuel into the system. The air and fuel will mix up near the turbocharger and then flows down through the intake, uh, manifolds to the aftercooler, through the throttle, uh, through the manifolds on the engine and into the cylinder where it is combusted. And at that point, it then goes out as uh, heat and spins the turbocharger faster, which brings more air in, which allows you to pick up more air and fuel. All of that takes time. But even under those circumstances, the block load capability on the island modes, particularly engines that are designed to be able to pick up block loads, are able to pick up pretty good sized loads. The first step is usually the slowest. In this case, a 25% block load would be able to recover within 20 seconds to be able to apply a second load to it. That's usually because the amount of heat in the exhaust system is not high enough to drive the air and fuel in that it needs to be able to recover quicker. Once you have that heat flowing through the exhaust system, your second step comes at a much quicker rate. So you can add another 25% block load and be able to recover within 10 seconds. And so as you can see, you can pick up block loads very quickly with the gas engine, much quicker than you had been able to over past years. Technology has allowed us to be able to do this. Another item that you can use to help yourself is to uh, be able to increase your fuel pressure. These engines are all uh, low pressure gas focused engines. They can use about one and a half to five PSI of gas pressure in their systems and your fuel system to be able to feed the fuel. The higher that fuel pressure, the quicker you're gonna replenish that supply as it tries to draw on the fuel supply to be able to feed a change in load. Plug or resized fuel filters um, is also a, it can be a problem. Um, when you size a fuel filter, which should be on every gas engine in the gas system, um, you usually size them so that when they are near the end of their uh, replacement cycle and you're getting ready to replace that filter, that the restriction on that filter is going to allow 100% of the flow needed for that gas engine. Uh, the fuel line restrictions can be a big difference. Uh, simply oversizing the fuel size line is going to give you a reservoir of fuel that's going to be a lot closer to the engine, which then allows you to be able to flow more fuel into the engine and be able to pick up your block load quicker. Air restrictions. If I can't get air in, I can't mix it with the fuel, and that becomes a problem as well. And, of course, re exhaust restrictions. So if I have uh, too much piping on that end, if my exhaust silencer is too small and creates a restriction, I can't get my exhaust out fast enough to be able to replenish the fresh charge into the cylinder to create my uh, my fire big enough to be able to pick up my block load, and it can have an effect. Also, another effect that you can see is the emission levels on an engine. If I'm using a one gram engine, it should seem evident that the, if I'm not as lean as if I would be if I had a half gram, I would be able to get more fuel per cubic foot into the engine to be able to get higher, um, higher loads out of that engine and higher um, acceleration, greater acceleration and power out of that engine. So a one gram engine will have a better uh, block load capability than a half gram NOx engine would. If we talk about combined heat and power as another alternative on some of these, combined heat and power is defined as the simultaneous and sequential use of power and heat from the same fuel source. So by saying that I have a, um, a fuel that's being entered into the engine like you would in your car, it's going to drive your wheels on your car, and on that nice cold morning when you move that lever over to the red side or the knob uh, to the red side and you start to heat your compartment, you're actually co-generating. And that's a in effect, what we're talking about here is taking heat that is technically wasted after the combustion process and being able to use it for some useful purpose. Normally, we think of a generator set being able to provide electric power, and that is true. The hot water on that engine can be somewhere between 195 and 260 degrees Fahrenheit, depending on the engine and the type of equipment that you're talking about. But the hot water can be used for almost any domestic hot water need or use within a facility. 
Uh, hot air can be used in places where there is a need, so heating or drying types of equipment uh, can be used for that. Uh, steam or hot water off of the exhaust system is available, usually pretty high quality uh, heat. And you can actually make uh, chilled water out of those systems as well through absorption chilling devices. And in some cases, if you have a need for uh, CO2, uh, you can use the CO2 as a uh, byproduct to be able to do some useful work uh, as well. So it could be in a greenhouse, for example, for fertilizing, or it could be in a bottling plant where you would use the uh, CO2 and make it into a um, food grade CO2 to be able to use it within your production system. All of that could be used in the basic data center, but also if you're co-located your data center near other facilities, you can use those, that heat and actually use that for beneficial purpose for these other facilities as well. So you can take your power, use it on your data center, use what heat you need for that source, and if you don't need any additional heat, uh, you have neighbors that would use it. If you have uh, systems like a um, district heating unit, as we see here, you could actually be using that heat for other purposes for other facilities and gaining revenue to help support your data center. So it can be a very positive way to do that work. There's also a possibility of doing tri-generation with this. And tri-generation is that you're taking your gas from in, through your genset, creating electricity. You can use the heat out of the exhaust and jack water system to drive an absorption chiller for cooled water. And you can also use the heat that's left over from that process to create hot water for use domestically. Now you can use any or all of these systems. You can use the chiller part during the summer and not during the winter. There's all different options that you can use, but the key to this whole thing is having it make economic sense. Now here we can take a look at what a typical cogeneration system might look like. And under these circumstances, uh, what you would have there is the front of that engine, the module on that front is the jack of water heat exchanger. And that's the size for taking the heat out of that engine and using it. Now you only need to use that if that's all you need for hot water. You may want to use though the exhaust system on there as well and be able to take the heat out of there. So the device sitting next to the engine in this case is a combined muffler, heat exchanger, and an exhaust after treatment system. All of that tied together in one module. The good part about these is that that jack of water heat exchanger and or the muffler and module can be located above the engine, right next to the engine as you see here, could be behind the engine, could be located almost anywhere near the engine that is convenient for your facility. So it doesn't have to be a very awkward or large facility in order to be able to do a good job of taking off the heat recovery for that project. As I mentioned before, the key to this is understanding your economics. So CHP may or may not make sense in your application, but if it does, uh, you're gonna look at your either heat loads or your electric loads, and one of those two is usually gonna drive where the, which is most important for you, and that's how you would set your system up. But the bottom line is you don't have to recover all of the heat to have it make sense. If I only need a little bit of heat for domestic hot water in the building to serve the people that are working in the data center, a small system on there to be able to take a, uh, the jack of water heat only for that purpose could be very beneficial and actually save you quite a bit of money over time. And, but you don't have to take 100% of the heat to make combined heat and power a useful option for you. The load profiles become very important in that you're gonna have some issues uh, with these, these systems and you need to understand whether the profiles of the electric need and the thermal need are gonna be coincidental or not. If they're not coincidental, then you need to be able to size your system based on the amount of heat I can get during my, uh, my lower load on the generator sets and not expect to get 100% of the, the potential heat out of that system if in fact I'm not using electricity at that time. So understanding that can be very useful and averaging both the heat and the um, uh, the jack of water, the, uh, the electric load, is not a good thing to do. Being able to understand the profiles and when they occur and whether they're simultaneous or whether they're coincidental or not does make a difference. Another option for some of these can be turbines in data centers. And what we have found is that there are advantages in some cases to the turbines being used in applications where there's a um, um, situation where there's a need be. The turbines and the gas engines have a lot of things in common. Both of them are low emission um, types of uh, devices. Both of them have extremely high reliability, oftentimes above 95% in the 97, 98% range. And that includes all maintenance and all work on the engine at all times. 
So very high availability uh, capacity factor on these units. Uh, excellent uh, for continuous and high load applications, uh, low life cycle costs, can be very quick to deliver and are both our proven technologies have been around for a while and have uh, people that can work on both of those systems. The benefits, the true benefit of the gas turbine is when you're using the combined heat and power need and you have a large heat load to the um, EKW ratio. So if you have very, a need for high quality heat, turbines can do a very excellent job of providing you with that. They do take minimal space and are relatively simple to design into these applications by being able to put a module in place. And there's a lot less downtime on these systems in that there's basically no, no um, top end overhauls or in frames or other work that you would do on it. You don't have oil changes to do on these engines. They just continue to run and will run for long periods of time. The one thing they don't like to do is do a lot of starts and stops. Recips don't mind that at all. It's a matter of starting and maintaining your starting batteries and your systems, but they do work extremely well in those applications. The other is that the turbines have a wide range of fuels that they can burn for use in, in their application. So there are a number of benefits for being able to look at and use turbines in these applications. And a lot of these is the wide range of fuels that you have available to you, the extremely high power density uh, that is available, and they can be at very low emission levels without after-treatment options on them. Uh, the shortcomings on turbines in some applications is that it does take a while for a turbine to start up. They are a larger device, and they take a while for them to get started. So uh, it's not uncommon to be in the four to 10 minute range on these things. They aren't as adaptable to the variable loads and particularly light loads. They prefer to be base loaded all the time. And they're not, um, they don't adapt well to applications where you have frequent starts and stops on some of these units. So which technology would you be using to be able to cover one of these systems? And how would you choose the right one? If I'm in a standby application and I require 10 seconds start, if I have a UPS system that is only about a minute operating time or 25 seconds, it's pretty evident that you're going to be using a standby diesel engine, an engine that will start very quickly and is very effective at being able to take your loads. If I'm going to be doing utility peaking and I'm running for, for 1,000 to 4,000, 5,000 or more hours per year, um, gas engines can be a very good option. They do take some time to start and to get into standby mode, but if you're interested in one that will get, be up and running and be a complete load within a minute to a minute and a half, uh, the gas engines can again work very well. If low pressure gas is all I have available on site, uh, the gas engines work on very low gas pressure but can do very well for you. And for heat recovery applications, if I have high altitude or high ambient temperatures, the gas engines again can work very well in these applications. If I have an extremely large uh, heat to power uh, ratio, the gas turbines are almost always your best bet. Uh, they do an extremely good job, particularly with that high uh, temperature steam and the pressures that are available online and can do an excellent job. But the key is that you don't necessarily have to look at all these as individual items. Hybrid systems where you're combining these systems together can be very effective in helping you um, get to where you need to be in your application. So if I have a utility uh, single feed, if I have the diesel standby units, it may be that a gas turbine or the recip engines could do very well for you in those applications and might be worth looking at to be able to lower your total operating costs for a data center and to be able to have not only just a single redundant system with the diesel backup, but also a situation where I have a um, where I have an extra uh, electrical capability uh, because of the gas supply that's there. If you look at what happened with Sandy in New York, when the systems went down and if they could not get diesel fuel to the sites, those that had dual gas and diesel um, systems on site had that second backup option for the gaseous fuels to be able to make those systems work. So it was very effective for them. Talk a little bit about service now. And Brian, can you take over, please? Thank you, Mike. Um, no matter what your, po your power generation solution is, uh, long-term system reliability is dependent on, on a rigorous preventive maintenance plan uh, for your facility and, and for your products. We all know the most common, I guess, common reasons that generators that fail to start um, when sitting in standby application is discharged or, or dead starting batteries, the unit not being in auto, no fuel, or bad fuel. Uh, low, low fluid levels or, or filter contamination. 
So what is needed to minimize uh, these and other risks to your facility? Maintenance needs to occur across the entire product life cycle, starting from, from shipping, and proper storage maintenance, ensuring regular and an annual maintenance. Um, all these things are key, along with system testing, to ensure that your system is ready to run when you need it to run. Uh, in addition to that, uh, condition monitoring uh, and system monitoring can really help to schedule uh, turn unscheduled downtime in, into scheduled repairs for your facility. Um, understanding you, your monitoring process, if you're able to monitor your product, monitor uh, the data, uh, you need to first establish uh, a baseline and, and normalized readings for the product, for your system. Uh, understanding your process, you need to then focus on changes occurring over time and, and trend that data and information. And then you need to have a, a set point and an understanding from those trending of, of when do you need to schedule a repair uh, instead of um, whatever event resulting in, in unplanned system downtime. Um, the majority of failures, as we talk about historical risks and recovery, um, are for uh, seconds. Very, very few outages uh, and failures last for days and for weeks. But we need to plan for those outages that could potentially last for days and weeks, um, whether they be from uh, disaster or a deliberate event that can cause a long-term outage, you need to have a plan in place of, of how you're going to manage your facility uh, for that event. Well, as I said, outages last minutes to weeks. Uh, I have a few uh, disaster events here, uh, starting with Mount St. Helens, Hurricane Ike, Hurricane Sandy, uh, all, all very all different, but, but all had long-term effects on, on the facilities and, and caused uh, many outages for facilities. So. What do we need to do to, to be positioned to manage not only our standard facility maintenance and standard practices, um, but how do we design for service and maintenance um, in the event of an outage? Having a design that's, that is uh, better matched for your power needs and equipment capability is crucial. Uh, having the plan for the unplanned events, what is your disaster preparedness? Do you have a rental generator a contingency plan? Do you have a quick connect box? Uh, installed at your facility, set up, integrated into your system with the ability to add a rental generator in the event of an outage. It also gives you the ability to tie in uh, load banks. You can also, you know, resistive load banks to mimic actual facility load and also uh, rent temp temp temporary chiller capacity if you ever have a need. Do you have an equipment first right of refusal? Uh, and in the event that you are running for an extended period of time during an outage, what is your maintenance plan, not for standard maintenance, but what is your outage maintenance plan? Uh, in the event of an outage, service intervals come up quickly. You are consuming filters and, and liquids. What do you have on site to make sure that you have you know, fuel filters, oil filters, the ability to add oil to the system? Um, how are you managing your fuel? What are those maintenance uh, plans for an outage? Do you have all those parts and, and, and have a process for how to manage your facility? in the event of an, of an operation, uh, or to operate in the event of an outage. Just some things to consider there, um, and, and make sure to plan for standard system maintenance and also maintenance uh, required during the event of an outage. And with that, I think I turn it back to Nick here. Thanks, well, uh, we are ahead, well, right on time. Thanks to both our presenters here, Brian and, and Mike. What we would like to do right now is, as we stated before, um, pose some questions live that you all had asked on the, on the conference here. And um, I'd like to start with a question here for Brian. Um, this question actually was repeated, I think, several times uh, during the webcast in different forms, uh, Brian, and it's re specifically related to the ability to, uh, to run an engine that is not tier four emissions compliant in the U.S. in anything but emergency. So is there any allowance or capability to run um, a diesel engine that's not tier four um, in a prime or continuous uh, duty application? You are able to, I've, first of all, that's, that's a very good question, uh, something that, that um, needs to be talked about. Um, with the two designations, the, the tier four, certified products being able to, uh, to certify prime and continuous markets. Uh, the emergency um, or um, the, the stationary emergency product is only for uh, standby use. 
uh, as defined by um, the federal EPA. So that, that impacts how you can operate your equipment. And as I said, that product is able to run for an unlimited number of hours in the event of an outage. But for the, the, the number of hours that you have the, the option and an ability to run that product on your own and of your own choice, you are limited to the 100 hours a year that includes your maintenance and testing is at 100 hours. You have 50 hours of general use in that 100 hours, which can include storm avoidance. And then you do have 100 hours a year that is allowable for demand response programs. But again, that's out of your 100 hours of maintenance and testing. Um, so those are really the, um, I guess, the, the key limitation there to, the, to it is how you choose to run it uh, outside of in the event of an actual utility outage. Thanks, Brian. I uh, got a question here from Mike that's just coming in from uh, John Clark. Uh, Mike, is there a minimum um, requirement for gas energy value when running a gas engine generator? Uh, there are minimum values, and it depends on what the engine is. Um, we do have engines that are capable of running down into the um, 300 BTU per cubic foot range. Uh, those engines are using using digester type carburetors, which make them uh, make them larger overflow uh, oversized because of the low volume of of actual burnable fuel in that in that um, substance to be able to get that into the engine, get enough BTU into the engine to be able to create the horsepower, you need a higher flow through there. And you have less flow then through your, your air intake system and your turbochargers. So we do have engines that are capable in that range. But the key here to success is when you're sizing out these systems, make sure that somebody knows, you know, that the uh, people supplying the engines are going to know what it is that you're working with and so that they can size the appropriate system to meet your application. Thanks, Mike. Um, similarly, for CHP applications, I had a couple questions come in talking about jacket water temperature limits. Um, for a, a CAT natural gas engine, do you, can you provide a guideline as far as how hot um, of a jacket water temperature is tolerable? On most engines, uh, natural gas engines, the uh, temperature is going to be uh, coming out at about 210, 210 degrees Fahrenheit, and or about 99 degrees C. And that makes it so that um, you can co collect quite a bit of that heat out of there. But your operating temperatures, you're going to have a differential temperature, so it's going to be in the uh, probably in the 195 to 200 range is the temperature you'd actually be able to see that water coming out at. Thanks, Mike. <clears throat> um, some, uh, some other similar questions that we had here, um, uh, in this case asking about absorption chillers, is there uh, sort of a rule of thumb efficiency that relates to that part of your CHP system? Obviously a lot of data centers have a need for uh, cooling requirements for uh, servers and such. Um, how efficient is an absorption chiller in general? Well, there are uh, basically two types of absorption chillers. One is a single stage and one is a two stage. A single stage will be in terms of coefficient of performance or COP will be somewhere in that 0 0.7 to 0 0.9 COP range. A double effect system would be uh, somewhere between, um, and, and again it depends on the system and the quality of the heat coming in, but it's going to be somewhere between 1.1 and 1.6, somewhere in that range, COP. Thank you, Mike. And then uh, just uh, on that continuation here of this theme, you talked a lot about CHP, um, you know, and, and there's a presumption by a lot of people, I sense, that you need to be running 24-7 in order to, to utilize a CHP system. Is, can CHP be done in lower hour applications, i.e. either at standby or on peak? Uh, sort of um, peaking plant, or what are when is it feasible to do CHP? The whole concept about CHP, or the reason why you would do it, is simply because you're going to save money. And oftentimes, the heat load or that you're working with, or a chiller load, in, in the case if I'm using an absorption chiller, uh, is going to be coincidental with the peak energy loads. So that if it makes economic sense to be running the electric side and 
there's, uh, you're basically looking at a payback of the equipment that will be running. It's not at all uncommon to have an engine that might run only uh, 1,500 or 2,000 hours, for example, to have, have it make economic sense because if I'm only going to take heat off of the jack of water and that's all I need, the heat recovery device for that is very inexpensive, and uh, relatively speaking, and it doesn't take very long at all to pay that back if I'm saving energy costs on the heat that's um, that I'm not having to use in a boiler um, during that time. So uh, you don't have to take 100%, and you don't have to take much of it at all. You just have to have enough that it makes economic sense to be able to provide the devices that you're using to be able to pick up that heat. Great. Thanks, Mike. Um, a question here about Tier 4, Brian. I think I'll pose this to you. For EPA Tier 4, um, how does choosing a Tier 4 rated diesel engine affect the ability of the system to start and accept load, let's say, I guess that presumes something tier two, tier three, or earlier? That's a good question. Yeah, um, I should have mentioned it in my slides here, but uh, for, for the diesel product, whether you have a, a, a tier two or tier three product or you have a, a tier four product, um, the, the after treatment added to that system is not going to impact your ability to, to pick up load, uh, to respond to, to, uh, to that load. Uh, and is, is not going to significantly impact uh, the time to start either. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got a lot of questions streaming in now here. And, um, we still have several minutes left. Um, somebody's asking about cat factory tours, and 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 um, I would just say, you know, if you go to your local dealer and you can go to cat.com if you have an interest to see some of this equipment. Uh, to our factories um, and see some of these applications. We certainly encourage you to, if you're not already in touch with your local cat dealer, um, please do um, search for your local cat dealer on cat.com. We have a dealer locator, and they can facilitate um, those types of requests. Um, there's a question here asking about dual fuel. Um, does Caterpillar have a dual fuel option today? Brian, you want to take that or you want me to? Mike, I will, I will kick it over to you. It looked like they were asking about, about low energy uh, gas fuels, though. Okay. Um, if the, the question could be about different gaseous fuels, and you can mix gaseous fuels so long as they are similar types of fuels. The key is that, for example, if I had a biogas, which was a low energy fuel that may only, uh, lower energy fuel that may only be having um, a rate of uh, maybe 300 or 400 BTU per cubic foot and natural gas, which would be at 920 BTU per cubic foot. The, the challenge is you can, you can, in fact, use them because methane is the base for both of those fuels. Um, but because of all the CO2 and the other materials that are in the uh, biogas, the fuel system has to be quite a bit larger. And the challenge when you use something that's designed for a 300 BTU, a fuel system that's designed for 300 BTU gas, when I put a 900 BTU gas in there, I just have to crack it open and I have enough fuel to basically run. And the challenge becomes uh, sometimes, that unless you're parallel to the utility for stability, uh, that your engine can be less stable because you have less control over the, um, the fuel system and the air and fuel ratio that's going into the engine. But in theory, uh, that can be done, and, and it's usually not a problem. It's, it's just simply a matter of making sure that you have the right pieces and parts to be able to do that and that you're doing it in a smart way. It's, it does create some technical challenges, but none of those are insurmountable. Thank you, Mike. Um, question here for Brian about Tier 4 engine um, maintenance and service practices. Specifically, is there big differences in oil changes um, with a Tier 4 product or general maintenance requirements? No, um, there's, there's not, I guess, significant variation from uh, the standard product. I, I think all of your, your intervals are, are based off of actual gen set and engine operation. So I mean, the biggest driver in, in your intervals is going to be um, how often are you running it. If you are running true Tier 4 and running prime, uh, you're going to come to those intervals uh, sooner than obviously if you were running product in a standby application. Thank you, Brian. Um, as I go down the list here, um, um, let's see. I have a question here. Um, can you comment? This is from Adam at AE2S. Can you comment on the required EPA reporting when using non Tier 4 engine? for applications other than emergency. For example, uh, it sounds like he wants to allow 
50 to 100 hours. Um, to, um, he assumes that the 50 to 100 hours have to be very accurately recorded as, as how those hours were used. Can you expand on that a little bit? Yes, Adam, that's, that's a very good question. Um, the EPA d does require um, the reporting, and I guess to tie it to a, a I guess a, a non-resettable hour meter of of how you operate, why you operated, and and when that operation occurred, and you have to be able to prove that. Uh, the challenge becomes is um, you are you are providing all that information to your local air board. So I've seen uh, some templates, but they they do vary. Um, so I would would say that you have to talk to your um, your local AHJ, your local air board, and find out if if they have a a firm process or a, a firm uh, procedure that they want followed and how they want that documented because it does vary uh, across North America. And expanding on, I saw you did have a follow-up question. Um, that, that again adds to, um, uh, I, I like the comment of having a, a JCO style screen that reports and animates, animates that process um, for the facility. Again, the challenge becomes is, is how does that become customized because it is not fully set as a federal standard and, and some local boards do require different report outs. Um, it, it becomes part of the challenge there, but that, that's a very good comment. Okay, and I think we are just about here at the end of our time scheduled for this webcast today. I know there were quite a few questions that had come in late that we didn't get a chance to, to answer. We'll be sure to follow up with those individuals. Um, on behalf of the whole Caterpillar team, I'd just like to thank all of our participants for joining us today. Um, thanks, Brian and, and Mike, for presenting today. Uh, we hope that everybody got something out of it. And if you could stick around, please, for just one more second. I'd like a couple of poll questions. I'd like your help. Uh, help us improve and help us get better and, and let us know uh, what you did experience today. Um, can you tell us if you were previously aware if that, uh, that Caterpillar offered all the energy products and services that you heard about today in, in the webcast? If you could please um, submit to us your response to this question. And then um, our last poll question as well. We'd like you to sort of tell us how we, we did today. Um, how would you rate the information that we provided on the webcast today? Um, in the full spectrum of possibilities there, we do appreciate that feedback. It will help us uh, next time around as we do our, our next webcast. Uh, thank you all for your participation uh, today, and we'll look forward to the next one. Thank you. <laughs>